As part of our litigation funding process, one of the aspects that we always look at is the defendant itself. Will the defendant be able to pay? And if they have the resources, are we able to get hold of those if they refuse to pay? So what's the enforcement risk? So understanding the defendant is really important as part of our process. Tim and Patrick, it would be great if you could talk me through some of the aspects that you look for when you're looking at a particular organisation in terms of their financial standing and their organisational structure. Sure. I'm happy to take a first go at this, Emily. One of the things that's really important when we're at the outset of any assignment like this is what we call our our early homework. And, and that's really our preliminary research to get an initial understanding of the footprint of the organization, entity, series of entities. In some cases, it's an individual. And we see a really broad spectrum of different subjects of interest. So sometimes when we do this kind of work, we're looking at a listed company with a very complex and, and disparate corporate footprint operations in multiple jurisdictions, that also tends to mean that the information environment we're looking at will be relatively rich and there'll be a lot of information to obtain and to analyze and to review. Conversely, sometimes we're just starting with a name or a translated or transliterated name for an entity or a principal or a director or shareholder. And there was an awful lot of work for us to do in the first instance, just to understand where is the company, what's the nature of its business, and can we get a sense of whether there is any information available in the public domain, which is, which is gonna inform our, our fact gathering and, and our information review and our analysis. So I suppose the first really crucial point here to, to get across is that we, we see a really wide spectrum of, of, of different kinds of defendants. And depending on the relevant geography and jurisdiction, the information that is available is, is going to, it can vary quite drastically. So the, the very first thing we will do is, is that initial research to understand what kind of company are we talking about? What sort of business? what kind of corporate footprint does it have? And sometimes that can be a very quick process and it can be very efficient. Sometimes that initial process can take hours and there can be an awful lot of head scratching and, and research just to get to the start line. Yeah, I guess I would jump in to uh, address, I think one of the key questions, you referenced this in terms of what the public information, what the publicly accessible information may be, depending on the jurisdiction. And, you know, I would kind of put this into two different categories, those that have those jurisdictions that have a lot of readily accessible information, for example, in the US where I'm based, in the UK where Tim is based, and a number of other countries, say in Europe, continental Europe and elsewhere. And I would juxtapose that with the other jurisdictions that are more challenging when we're looking at defendants, say in places like China, Russia, some countries in the Middle East. There was just an article actually, I think yesterday in the news about, and this has been sort of a continuing effort over some years, in China, the government has blocked certain corporate uh, information providers from providing that information to foreign customers. So increasingly, it's become very difficult to access even basic corporate records, corporate ownership, certainly getting at ultimate beneficial ownership is, is a very challenging thing to do based on the records that are publicly available in a place like China, a place like Russia, where there's been an effort really, I would say in the last year plus to scrub some of those records, even going back historically, whereas let's say information on companies that were set up in the 2000s, in 2010s, early 2020s even, where it was accessible. Now, some of these repositories have been scrubbed of that information. Some of that's driven by the effort to protect interests from U.S. sanctions and European sanctions. Others are just based on you know, sort of autocratic governments that are protecting political and government interests, 
those that may be accused of corruption and holding beneficial ownership in companies that that uh, may be questionable. So we, I think we find a, a sort of a mixed bag. There are certainly some jurisdictions that have a whole host of information and then others that are more challenging and lead us to rely on more deep digging outside of uh official corporate records and and getting into more of, well, I think we'll, we'll talk about this a little later, some of that intelligence-based sort of approach in, in gathering information. So you're talking about certain jurisdictions and um, publicly available registers may not be up to date. What other sources of information can you turn to and, and what would your approach be in, in those more difficult to assess jurisdictions? Sure. You know, as as Tim mentioned, the starting point is always determine at a basic level what is available. So we start with that sort of understanding the jurisdictions, understanding what official corporate records may be available. And then we start to go move sideways to look at things like media reports, other kind of business record databases that are uh, amalgamating information from a variety of different sources, whether it be press reports, uh, you know, some kind of public filings that may be sort of sitting out there historically and have been accumulated over time from a Dun & Bradstreet or uh, other sources uh, of information. And doing a, a scouring of the web for, you know, one of the things we'll do is we're going to look at both English and the local language. And so oftentimes it's really being very meticulous in looking at public disclosures, online reports, you know, media reports, you know, various other kinds of sources like that, scouring everything we can, sweeping all that information up and then assessing where we may have some gaps and where it may be useful to start talking to people. We always kind of stage this with our clients in a in a very methodical way where we'll typically do some kind of reporting to them based on everything that's out there in the public record, open sources, and then together assess very carefully how are we going to make that next step in terms of potentially talking to whether it's former employees, uh, other folks in the industry, competitors, uh, former business partners, litigation opponents, that, that sort of categories of, of human sources that we'll start to think about talking to. And, and that's when we get into more of those inquiries and interviews that can be quite useful for gathering information that's not in a paper or electronic record. The other thing I'd add to that is, as Patrick was saying, there is that initial stage of sort of helping the client understand the, the information environment, if you like. And there's almost a waterfall of different sources of information. So certainly in a contentious context, your, your gold standard is corporate registries, official filings, filed accounts, annual reports, that kind of material. And in some cases, we find that quickly and efficiently, you can access that information and you can get a good understanding of what it is and, and what it demonstrates. At the other end of the spectrum, you you then have an information environment where, the, and Patrick alluded to this, the corporate registry that doesn't exist or the information that is filed is extremely limited. It's very patchy. There are lots of blind spots and there are different ways and means in terms of tools and technology using different aggregators using data sources and, and different data points to make sure that we're conduct, conducting a really meticulous search for any leads of, there might be cached versions of company websites, there might be local media reporting in a different language, which makes reference to a significant transaction or an event or some sort of material situation involving the, the entity or the, the company in, in question. And then sometimes, and this is less usual, but certainly something that we do see is it's a very iterative process. So we go through this kind of triaging process at the outset. And sometimes we are looking at issues in a jurisdiction where the information environment in the public domain is, is almost non-existent. And in those instances, you're, you're often at an early stage starting to think about an intelligence led methodology whereby you're, you're trying to establish factual leads and looking to expand the scope of understanding what's available in in that way but I, I would say most of the time there is there is some level there is some kind of footprint in the public domain 
and once you have a handle on that, you can then form your strategy as to as to the information gathering process and and the analysis that's that's going to be possible. And the other thing, conversely, is that I think there's sometimes a misnomer amongst clients or this perception that if you're talking about a jurisdiction like England, and Wales, and the UK or the US or continental Europe, that automatically information environment will be very comprehensive, will be very rich, things will be readily available. That's not always the case. Certainly in different European jurisdictions, that's not always the case in terms of what sort of available is filed and disclosed as a matter of public record. And also we sometimes find ourselves in the kind of ironic situation we're working on a matter at the moment where the, the issues are primarily in the UK. There is a vast amount of information filed at UK companies' house, but there is an awful lot of legwork to do to go through that, to analyze it, to look for different clues. You know, in, in that situation, we've got reams and reams of documents and filings and accounts and, and other sorts of information. And the challenge then becomes, how do you cut through that? And how do you, how do you review and analyze it very carefully? So there's, there's no hard and fast rule. And, it, and it's certainly not the case that in one jurisdiction, automatically there will be a huge amount that's available and there will be an easy route to it. I think it really does depend hugely on the, on a case-by-case basis. Tim, you talked about the sort of information landscape and the sources of data that are out there. What's the best way to provide instructions to you guys? So how can we put together information to give you the best start in reviewing what's there? Great question. I think the most important thing, we, we, we talk quite a lot in our team about what is the client's exam question? If you had to articulate it in one sentence, or a couple of sentences, what is the question that you're trying to answer without being sort of overly simplistic, fully appreciate some of these matters are complicated and very nuanced, and you'll, you'll have a headline question with three or four subheadings. But for example, is the priority understanding the asset position and financial standing of a business, or is it understanding its profile, reputation, and perception within a certain market or sector? Is it understanding its recent transactional history, if it's particularly acquisitive? And just thinking about the the, the core exam question that you're trying to answer and, and setting it out at an early stage, as opposed to a whole range of different queries, thoughts, subheadings at, at the outset because as i say it's 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 an iterative process and we will constantly remind ourselves when we're when we're working on a matter when we're conducting research when we're doing our analysis we'll always go back to the whiteboard and think about what what is the the central exam question here and it's sometimes important to have a conversation at a very early stage about how realistic it will be to try and answer the question because in some instances, depending on the nature of the defendant entity or the jurisdiction and the nature of the question, that there are going to be real limitations to what's to what's achievable and what's possible. And we, we want to sort of manage that expectation at the outset, but also think creatively about if this is your, your central and primary point, are there other ancillary issues or is there other contextual information that could also be relevant given the challenges in, in drilling down into this, this precise issue? I like one of my former partners used to to use this phrase, we're not librarians. So sometimes when we are at our best working with clients who are trying to understand the the whether it's the jurisdiction or footprint of a defendant or a financial position, assets, getting those specific questions as to what is most important to counsel what's going to advance the case, what's going to be the key to this particular matter. It's not just sort of giving us a name and saying go and collating a whole bunch of information, but it's really being targeted and and thinking analytically as to what's going to be useful to the client. So for us, that's always a challenge and always something that we need to be thinking about in our mind. But I think to answer your question in terms of what is, is sort of puts us in the best position to help you. It's having really particular questions to start. And then as Tim mentioned, oftentimes it'll bring us in different directions. It'll expand as we go or or contract, uh, you know, because we don't see oftentimes. I mean, I think that's one thing to be very clear about is that these are challenging cases when you're 
trying to get at really hard to find information sometimes in certain jurisdictions that just isn't available in the public record can be very challenging to get to the right source if we move to that or, or potential witness if we move to that speaking to people phase. It's you know being very clear about what our exam questions are and where we may not be able to be, be, be realistic, where we may not be able to get to the end of that and answer those questions. So I, I think the, the better we are focused at the beginning, the, the better result we're gonna have at, at the end. You talked about some jurisdictions being more difficult or having less publicly available or less accurate publicly available information than others. And you talked about China and, and Russia. Which are the kind of red flag jurisdictions where it's going to be really difficult to, to make headway? I'm always learning new answers to this as we go along. And I have to say, I'm also sort of consistently surprised about this because I think we mentioned earlier, I think there's sometimes an assumption or a preconceived notion that this jurisdiction will have extensively available information. It's a major financial services hub. It has a regulatory authority. Therefore, there's going to be an awful lot of disclosure. There's going to be lots of financial statements and, and, and a treasure trove of documents and information for us to sink our teeth into. That's very often not the, not the case. So for example, Switzerland can be a really challenging jurisdiction to, in the sense that there is obviously a level of transparency there. It's a very sophisticated jurisdiction in terms of it being a major hub for financial services operations. It's got a very complex legal and regulatory frame, framework related to banking secrecy. And while there are in place rules and regulations about what, what businesses and companies, what sort of documents and information they, they need to file, actually what we find is that there's not actually that much in there. So drilling down into, in, in particular detail, into shareholders, directors, into sort of the corporate makeup of a, of a, of a company registered in Switzerland can be really challenging. Also, another example, I guess also the, the, the DIFC, is another one where very sophisticated financial hub and you know it seemed to be a very easy transparent open place to to do business huge amount of commerce and, and money flows going through the jurisdiction but there are limited disclosure ob obligations there so we often find we worked on a matter recently and the exam question was does this dubai entity have any assets in simple terms and the client was interested in assessing the potential merits and viability of a, of a counterclaim against a Dubai entity as, as part of a, a wider corporate group. And what, what we discovered very quickly was that there was, there was a real limit to the information that we could obtain that had been filed in the International Financial Center there. And actually, the ancillary in corporate records and disclosures that were made at Companies House in the UK and we found that through some reverse engineering and a, and a really granular review of the corporate documents available in the UK, we were able to build an understanding of quite a complicated intra-group lending structure, whereby different, and there was, I think, a Luxembourg holding company, there was a large UK business. And what we were able to establish, in part through information that we obtained from UK Companies House, and in part from information that we, corporate documents that we obtained in Luxembourg was looking sort of the, the other way up the chain. There was a, a complicated series of intra-group lending and, and financial arrangements. And we could see that while the Dubai entity appeared to be in good financial standing, what became very clear was that it was being lent money by two other entities in the corporate group. And the only way we were able to find that out, the, the route to that information and that analysis subsequently was was not in the DIFC and the information we could obtain there. It was within another jurisdiction. I was just going to add also that, you know, Tim referenced some of this, but there's a whole host of what, um, you know, uh, folks commonly refer to as offshore jurisdictions. So mm. to, to mm. you know, BVI, Caymans, Jersey Islands, that sort of uh, jurisdiction. And I think, you know, again, as Tim also mentioned, these are places that have 
financial regulators and all, but in terms of the uh, disclosure information, it can be quite limited. It can literally be the date the company was incorporated, a registered agent, and an address, and that's basically it. There's no share register. There's you know, no financial reporting that's publicly available. And in those sort of situations, as I mentioned earlier, it's scouring what you can in terms of the public record, uh, because oftentimes you may not get direct disclosure in the corporate filings, but you may see this company was previously a litigant in a, another matter. So it can be very important to look at uh, you know, various courts around the world, whether it's U.S. courts, which oftentimes, given the, the sort of uh, extraterritorial jurisdiction, the U.S. seems to take both from a, uh, a government perspective and then uh, because of the U.S. being sort of a financial center, oftentimes monies and, uh, you know, and, and activity come through the U.S. and it can be a, a jurisdiction of, of interest and, and a location for litigation that we can tap into or in the U.K. or other places. So it's important to, to move beyond it. Even if the company's in BVI, you might want to be looking in, in the U.S., the U.K., et cetera, for a footprint of activity or litigation that could be quite useful. And then you know, as I mentioned earlier, in places like China, where increasingly it's become difficult to access information, and you know, in terms of pursuing Chinese defendants for enforcement, it can be you know nearly impossible. We're doing a matter right now where it's a Chinese defendant, and the key exam question for us from the client is: let's identify jurisdictions outside of China where this entity may have a footprint, may have some assets and areas that are favorable jurisdictions to pursue the judgment and enforcement. And so that sometimes becomes the the jumping off point, maybe China or Russia or uh, the uh, UAE and DIFC, but it'll be, take you to other jurisdictions that could be more favorable for the client. And that oftentimes is a foundational question that we get is where else can we look? You mentioned sort of the corporate registers and publicly available information, but maybe we can talk a bit about human intelligence and what role that has to play and what questions could be answered through that route. Sure. It's one of the most important issues to clarify at the at the outset of of all these kinds of engagements where I mean ultimately our job is to find information that's going to better inform the client's decision making process. The difference and the distinction between evidence and intelligence is, is, a, is a really important one. And I guess what we sometimes find is that evidence is it, it's admissible. So whether that's documents that are, that are filed in a corporate registry, their financial statements that have been audited or, or something similar, it tells us very little, and we might have anecdotal feedback from several well-placed sources in the financial services sector in that jurisdiction who have working knowledge of the defendant entity in question, and who are able to deliver really interesting insight about financial performance, a transaction that's gone wrong, or another similar issue. And it's always really important just to, just to clarify at the at the beginning of the engagement the gold standard really and and what is going to be of of most use in the in the context of any kind of legal proceedings or any sort of contentious con- scenario is is really documentary evidence at the same time sometimes that documentary evidence is non-existent or what it tells you is very very limited and an intelligence-led methodology whereby you're looking to have a series of interactions confidentially with different individuals who are able to comment or describe a particular set of circumstances, individuals, the structure of business, its, its reputation and profile within that market. That can be hugely valuable and insightful, both in a strategic context and providing you, the client, with with a better understanding of what appears to be going on, with the caveat that that sort of anecdotal feedback, that kind of human intelligence is, is not going to be admissible. And also, what we often find is in situations where there are lots of blind spots or there's a paucity of information in the in the public domain, 
an intelligence-led methodology can be really critical in helping to establish additional factual leads. And in an ideal scenario, one methodology will, will complement and corroborate and lead the other and you you have the the combination of the of the two so it's it's a conversation that we have a lot we do a lot of work with with law firms acting as external counsel at all different stages in a in a, in a dispute you know be that arbitration litigation or, or or often when things are at a very early stage and we'll always have that conversation at the at, at the very beginning because in our minds an intelligence led methodology can be very, very helpful. It can be very useful. And it's often critical in, in establishing further factual leads. It, it's just understanding and making clear at the outset that the, the output of that methodology and of those interactions and of those conversations is different and needs to be used in a different context to documentary evidence that you'd, you'd get out of a corporate register. So on the majority of our engagements, in an ideal scenario, we would have a combination of the two, and one is, is stress testing and informing and corroborating the other. And sometimes, as Patrick said earlier, if you're in a particularly challenging jurisdiction, you have to start with an intelligence-led methodology, which can then lead you into other avenues of inquiry, and it may ultimately lead you to accessing, ob obtaining documentary evidence and written material that would that would be of an admissible standard. So I would add also that in some situations, we also will work with counsel and the client to sometimes bring some of that human intelligence into a more evidentiary context and turn this into a more formal witness statement. We've had cases in the past where we are working in an arbitration or litigation context and we may reach out to a variety of human sources, individuals that may have worked at the company, had some past dealings with them, and it may start as intelligence, but we've had success in some cases being able to convince those folks to, you know, pr perhaps prov sit down with counsel uh, themselves and, you know, after speaking with us and, and doing a preliminary interview and provide a statement that can be admissible in arbitration proceedings in particular let's let's say i've worked on a matter in the past where their client had engaged us to do a first phase of that sort of documentary evidence investigation looking for information in the public record in open sources to try and advance their claim and then move to a second piece of actually reaching out to perhaps dozens of parties to try and see if we could find some potential witness who might be willing to, to go on the record and provide a statement. So we can be a useful tool as investigators working with counsel to be that first step to start perhaps intelligence gathering phase of talking to people, but then turning that more to an evidentiary gathering uh, exercise as well and, and bringing some of these this information from human sources on the record. That's really interesting. When you engage with human sources, how do you ensure that the engagements are sort of legal? So I think, you know, there's commentary around sort of different ways of, of obtaining information, but how are you confident that the people you work with are providing information in in a way that's in compliance with the local law maybe i can can start and then and then tim should chime in one of the things that that is just a key foundational approach to our, our work in this area and really in everything that we do is we call the work in, uh, investigating for the record so whether it's doing due diligence or uh you know, in a pre-transactional context and the information we gather, or in this sort of litigation, arbitration, disputes context, that everything we do is able to withstand scrutiny in courts or uh, with uh, government regulators. And so that's our approach in, uh, you know, always complying with local laws that you know, I think in, in specific to your question in terms of how uh, gathering information when we start talking to people to ensuring that that's, you know, potentially going to be admissible or just is certainly ethical and legal. 
it's approaching it in an overt manner in terms of we are who we are. Uh, we are, you know, Patrick Elkar from the Risk Advisory Group and looking for your help on this matter. And so we approach people not pretexting, not misrepresenting who we are, but really sort of directly approaching these things in a very ethical and, and legal way. So, I mean, that's sort of a starting point in terms of our information gathering is whether it's gathering information that is legitimately publicly accessible, not tapping into information that we should not have access to publicly. And then in terms of how we approach people when we speak to them, that it's a very open and overt and direct approach. On that point too, we also have a rigorous vetting procedure in, in place from a, from a compliance and risk management perspective, whereby any interactions we have with a third party in relation to any matter, as, as Patrick said, it's crucially important that we set the scene for that in, in the right way and we explain the context of the interaction. There is obviously a fine balance there and that a lot of the time when we're working on client engage, engagements, if not all the time, the client is relying on us to access insights, perspective, anecdotal feedback, commentary through a back-to-back -back confidentiality, if you like, that they would not be able to obtain themselves in, in having that interaction, either because they're not able to access a particular network or a, or a group of individuals, but also because certainly on any matter that we work on, but particularly for something that's in the context of, of legal proceedings, there is clearly a balance between not divulging to any individual the, the specific circumstances of the engagement, the identity of our client, that has to be balanced with, as Patrick said, being overt, clear, transparent. We're a risk advisory group. We're working on a mandate for a particular client, and we are interested in, in your perspective on XYZ issue. And also another point that we, we often reiterate is that we would never pay people for information, but on occasion, depending on the specific circumstances, we will compensate people for their, for their time and effort in looking to have other conversations and, and, and looking to go away and interact with others and provide that feedback to us. And I think that's a really, really important point. An intelligence-led methodology and interacting with, with human sources that can provide really valuable insight, it's not a shortcut into accessing information illegitimately or, or information that's not within the, the public domain. It's really about sort of trying to gather insight and an independent perspective that the client simply isn't able to access. We play a really critical role in that, but the managing some of the risks associated that and making sure that that's done in an entirely ethical and legitimate manner is, is very, very important. Can you give a, an example of a, a case that you're really proud of without revealing any confidential information? <laughs> <laughs> I can definitely think of a, of a couple, Patrick. Maybe we can we can trade a couple of case studies. One of the matters that we worked on a couple of years ago now was a very, very complicated multi-jurisdictional asset mapping exercise in the context of arbitration proceedings. And it was an interesting situation in that we were engaged by external counsel. We also had an existing relationship with, with their client, with the, with the corporate actor which is an international commodities house involved in a joint venture arrangement that had gone very wrong. And it was a really complicated dispute. And one of the challenges at the outset was that both counsel and the ultimate client had a good working knowledge of the defendant party because they had been in a commercial joint venture arrangement with them for several years that had then gone awry. And I think on, on that matter, the, the, it, so we covered multiple jurisdictions, the Netherlands, the UK, France, Cyprus, Finland, Kazakhstan, the British Virgin Islands. The defendant party had an incredibly complex, disparate corporate footprint. And it became very clear that while the ultimate client had a good working knowledge of the, the sort of commercial operational aspects of parts of that business, in terms of the corporate structure and the corporate makeup, there was a lot that was that was right under their nose that they they really were not aware of. And, and I can remember on that matter, we had to gather a huge amount of information across several different jurisdictions. And we, we had to go through this process of effectively building 
a map of the defendant party's corporate structure and then stress testing that with, with, with the client or with external counsel. And one of the really crucial issues that we identified was that we, I believe in corporate records from memory in Cyprus, we found a document that described a demerger comprising a transfer of assets between effectively the primary defendant entity that was named in the arbitration proceedings and a previously unknown entity. What it meant was effectively the, the defendant entity that was a named party in the arbitration proceedings was effectively on paper a corporate shell. And it was a really crucial issue for external counsel and the client because there was a massive challenge around being able to, they would have been able to enforce against the primary defendant entity, but all of its assets had been transferred elsewhere within, within the corporate group. So I, I guess good example of just meticulous, granular, laborious research over a long period of time. And that particular, you know, that information and the and the finding that came out of our analysis was it was on an obscure corporate registry, it was filed, it had been disclosed, it was there. And in a sense, it was hiding in plain sight. And after sort of many months of research and analysis, we were we were able to get a much better understanding of that. And I think also just the the satisfaction of it was a it was a the, the quantum in the matter was very, very significant. And I think the ultimate client came into it with a view that they knew their adversary very well. They were intimately familiar with the operations and functions of the business. And we were able really to peel back the layers of the corporate structure and demonstrate to them that actually the makeup of the business, the location of certain assets and the way it operated in a legal sense on paper was very, very different to what they saw to be the sort of commercial reality on a, on a day to day. So that, that was a really challenging one, but it was, it was also a really satisfying one. What about time? So how long should we think about leaving an investigation to run to, to answer the exam question? I know this might be different in different situations, but what kind of timescales are we looking at in general? It varies hugely on a case-by-case basis and depending on the exam question. I think we would like to think that at a relatively early stage, we are able to give a clear understanding of, of what the art of the possible is. Do we think it is viable and realistic to try and answer the exam question or we do we think there are there are fundamental challenges? And sometimes that can be over a matter of days. Sometimes it can be a, a matter of hours if we're if we're conducting preliminary scoping research and looking to help the client understand what may be out there, what may be available, and how would we approach this with our investigation strategy. We have worked on matters. We worked on something very recently, which was under very significant time pressure, where we were able within just under three weeks to go from commencement of the engagement, detailed briefing from the client, which is an international law firm acting for a financial services business in a particularly complicated dispute. And they had, I guess, one very simple question. We then worked with them to establish that actually there were there were four key subheadings to that. And there was a real challenge around whether or not we would be able to provide comprehensive information to give them a, a satisfactory understanding on their core question, but the but the other questions that came out of that actually became crucial in weighing up their strategic advice. And, and that example actually is, is an interesting demonstration whereby there was a relatively detailed body of information in the public domain, but there were also limitations to corporate filings made in certain jurisdictions. And some of the intelligence feedback that we were able to gather, which was relatively anodyne. It was talking about, the question was very much about the asset position of an entity within a a specific jurisdiction. We were able to identify some information that was not particularly detailed and didn't really shed much, much light on that. And the anecdotal feedback that we got from several sources in the financial services sector they were able to comment on things such as well what how big is their is their office in the jurisdiction how many employees do they seem to to have are they a known entity in that market 
what's the sort of perception of their of of their profile and how they do business and and through gathering some of that in intelligence on the one hand we weren't able to say here is the slam dunk answer here are the filed financial disclosures which demonstrate the precise asset position of this entity at a point in time we were able to say we've got extensive feedback from a range of different sources which would lead one to the logical conclusion that they have a significant presence there they have a large office they have a number of employees they have a great reputation and they're known for doing business discreetly and and carefully and and it enabled the council team to to make a sensible judgment call about the the original big picture question of the of the asset position and whether or not it was viable to pursue a, a further claim against the entity in question.